All right, well, let's open up our Bibles together to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verse 22 through 33 this morning. And I want to invite you today to trust in Jesus. Pastor Aaron, I mean, I'll tell you what, the choir was getting a little Baptocostal there. I, I was loving it, which I'm a huge Holy Spirit fan, so I hope that you guys are too. I'm a kind of more Baptocostal than I am anything else. And uh, if you guys say a few amens today while I'm preaching, I promise to preach shorter if, uh, if that's okay with you. Uh, it's such a great honor for me to be here while you have a group of students in Pittsburgh serving with my church that uh, we've planted. Uh, our official launch is this Easter. Uh, we had the plans of when we moved to Pittsburgh this past August of planting a church by this fall in one location. God has been moving in such a powerful way. Uh, we are planting our church on Easter Sunday in two locations. And so your students are worshiping at our downtown location uh, on top of Mount Washington this morning. And then tonight they'll be at our location that's um, out in the airport area, the west side of Pittsburgh. And so, man, gospel partnership, isn't it great? Um, I am, uh, yes, we can thank God for that. Um, as a church planter, uh, Dr. Clausen's here. Uh, I defended a, a, a work here and got my doctorate at Southern Seminary, and I had no idea that I was doing all that work over the last couple of years that as I was preparing this and, and defending this work that I had done on church planning that God would call me to plant a church again. Uh, I came into the city of New Orleans uh, 15 years ago, pre and post Katrina, planted a church there 11 years ago, and uh, after planting a church there, uh, because this makes sense, God called us to Pittsburgh from New Orleans. Um, God is in the business of doing things that don't always make sense. Uh, but when he speaks, as my grandfather, who went to be with Jesus, a mighty preacher of God's word, God's call trumps all. And to walk in the promises of God together with you, I want you to know planning a church um, now a second time, these types of gospel partnerships, your hospitality, generosity to Vintage Church in Pittsburgh is not some sort of side thing for me. This is a lifeline for me. And so thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the way in which you pray, give, and go. And uh, it's just a huge honor for me to be with you today. Let's go into scripture together. Um, I want to invite you today, no matter where you are, if you perhaps got stuck in a traffic jam and you sound, somehow found your way uh, parking here and walking into this church, not knowing what this was, uh, I want you to trust in Jesus today. If you've been a faithful member of this church longer than I've been alive, I invite you to trust in Jesus today. We're gonna look at an amazing text here. This is right after Jesus feeds the 5,000 with a catfish po' boy. And we find here in Matthew chapter 14, now um, look in this text with me. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So Jesus is doing some things here. And he tells his disciples that we're gonna get into the boat, you gotta, gotta, gotta get into the boat, and we're gonna get to the other side. When Jesus makes a promise, he delivers. He's orchestrating some things here. Look in verse 23, it says, after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, if you want to highlight that in your iPad or on your iPhone or underline that in your text there, in the fourth watch of the night, this is significant, Jesus came to them. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I struggle with God's timing. Man, I've had some good whiteboard sessions. Man, I've told God a few things about how things should go in my life. This is one thing we can trust today with so many things we can't trust anymore. You can always trust that God's timing is perfect. And here he comes in the fourth watch of the night, walking on the sea. Don't see that every day. 
In verse 26, it says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, ah, it is a ghost. (laughs) They cried out in fear. But immediately in verse 27, the beautiful, kind words of Jesus, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him. Anybody love Peter? I love Peter. When you read about Peter, it's hope for guys like me and your pastor. Because Peter doesn't always get it right. But yet God's in the business of doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And here Peter, I love the boldness of Peter. He answered him, Lord, if it is you, and Peter's self-aware. He doesn't just say, I'm coming. He says, command me. Peter was fully aware that he had no ability to walk on water. So he says to Jesus, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And so Peter had taken one leap of faith. (laughs) He he had taken one step to a city called Pittsburgh where I learned this past winter, Old Navy doesn't work. (laughs) Growing up in New Orleans, the best winter gear I'd ever had was from Old Navy. I found out I needed better gear than Old Navy. So take one step, and it's real easy to take one step of faith like Peter did and and to find yourself in a city where people don't talk like you and and to look around and and to see the, the need in a city or to see what's overwhelming about this leap of faith that you've answered in your life to follow God and to look around and and to perhaps see what's stacked up against you. So can I ask you today, are you here in the house looking at the wind and the waves or the one who controls the wind and the waves? You're gonna find out real quick, I've come all the way from Pittsburgh, my family and I drove through a tsunami last night to get here. Um, (laughs) We've come all the way to Pittsburgh and, and I hope somebody gets something from this, Pastor Aaron, but like, I'm just preaching it myself today. So I hope you guys get something, but I'm, I'm trying to remind myself today to trust in Jesus because over the last few months, I've, I've spent too much time looking at the wind and the waves. And so Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus. He cries out, Lord, save me. In verse 31, it says, Jesus immediately, anybody thankful that Jesus is there? Anybody thankful for the amazing saving grace of Jesus. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, oh you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, everybody say truly. Truly, you are the son of of God, the word of the Lord. Specifically over the last couple years, there's been a phrase that I've repeated to myself over and over and over again. And it's this, reflective praise inspires future perseverance. Reflective praise inspires future perseverance. Um, To summarize myself to you, I was born and raised in the city of New Orleans, but I'm a first-generation American. My entire family's from South Africa. Uh, My parents were just faithful members of a church, um, grew up as preacher's kids, but hadn't yet been called by God into full-time ministry, and a Mississippi preacher showed up in South Africa, preached a revival. God used that preacher to call my parents 
to America, and in two months, they sold all their possessions and moved from South Africa to America as missionaries to America. And I know that's tough for us to hear, but praise God, America's not the hope of the world. We need the world to come to us, and God calls people to us too. And so, um, if I could just say, my parents took this leap of faith to a place called New Orleans. That was in 1979, I was born in 1981. And uh, I grew up in that city. Uh, my dad uh, got his seminary degrees there and became professor of evangelism and began to preach with the Billy Graham Association. And I was saved at the age of seven. My dad was preaching revival. And, and yes, God used my dad, but my dad didn't save me because back in the day, revival preachers only had five sermons. And I had heard that sermon my entire life. I could quote it, even with an accent, as my dad speaks with a whole potato in his mouth. And so I, I had heard that over and over, but Jesus changed my life at the age of seven. And so I grew up in that city, and at the age of 13, my dad accepted the call to be the pastor of First Baptist Church of Spartanburg, South Carolina, where he's had the privilege of being a pastor there for over 25 plus years. And I grew up in that church and had such an amazing time, but the Lord and uh, college um, called me into full-time ministry. And I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere except New Orleans. <laughs> He said, you're going to New Orleans. And that was right before Hurricane Katrina. And, and so we spent time in uh, New Orleans and I had the privilege of serving with Dr. Platt uh, before and after Hurricane Katrina as his assistant. And then the Lord after Katrina called us into that city and I spent time helping to rebuild that city. So many of you probably came to New Orleans to help us rebuild and so thankful for the faith-based, church-focused work that happened in our city. And, and through that, um, my wife, she was... Uh, working as a massage therapist in the city of New Orleans. <laughs> and yes, it's awesome being married to a massage therapist. <laughs> um, we got to know her coworkers, and over dinner one night, by God's grace, we were able to lead one of her coworkers to the Lord. And God called us off that seminary campus into the heart of uptown New Orleans, and we started a Bible study that became Vintage Church. God's amazing grace poured out in this congregation. We had some rough rides. Um, in eight years, we moved 13 times. The, the slogan for our church, Aaron, was this, we're a cool church if you can find us. <laughs> and, and we ended up merging with a church and, and we did this whole building expansion and, and we finished it and I stood up to preach. The place was packed out and, and I preached on Jesus' words that he will build his church. And as I stood up to preach, I was working on my doctoral work and I had been meditating and, and praying and, and, and reading a lot about church planning and, and God told me I was finished in New Orleans. It took me two months to tell my wife. <laughs> I didn't wanna leave, this was home for me. We had finally bought a house that we wanted to live in. Our kids were finally in the school. I had the dream staff. I mean everything that we had worked so hard for. What do you mean, Lord? I gotta go, I'm finished? So we began a process of opening up our hands and saying, Lord, wherever you call, we'll go. Almost went to Orlando, Florida with an opportunity and, and the Lord shut that opportunity, but that opportunity put me on the North American Mission Board's radar and I got a phone call by a guy that you might have heard of, his name's Kevin Ezell. And he was like, Rob, I want you to pray about something. <laughs> and I said, all right, Kevin. Man, don't, don't just go to Orlando. We have 32 North American cities. And, and if you've planted a church in one of our strategic cities, would you pray about planting a church in another one of our cities? And I was like, oh, okay, Kevin, like, let's, let's pray about this together. What do you have in mind? He goes, we'll take you anywhere in Canada. He said, well, we'll take you maybe out in the West. He said, but if you want to really know where we would love for you to pray about going to, it's the city of Pittsburgh. And I said to him over the phone with a lot of humility, but straightforwardness, that sounds terrible. <laughs> and he was like, don't knock it till you try it. And so um, we took a trip and God does what he does. In one trip, the Lord Jesus broke our hearts for that city. And we took a journey where we moved to the city of Pittsburgh this past August. <laughs> and we moved our family into 
an unknown city, and I can just tell you this, I've been anticipating a miracle of God because this was not on my five-step life plan. There's no way I planned this. God orchestrated something. And I want you to know this, that as I've walked into this, anticipating a, a new launch of our church in the city of Pittsburgh, as you guys are in this point right now, I want you to know beyond any shadow of a doubt, today we can trust in Jesus. For Jesus is promising to advance his kingdom to the ends of the earth as we consider this text this morning. I want you to know that what Jesus was doing here was creating a moment for his disciples to prepare them for future moments. This moment is not just for the moment in and of itself. If I can tell you straight up, I know that the last 10 years of my life in the city of New Orleans have prepared me for the next 10. Highview Baptist Church, God has been doing some things in your life and he's taken you through some things, some highs and some lows. And may I submit to you that God is working all these things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. See, Jesus had a bigger plan in place here. And as we consider this text, listen, I wanna give you some important things. We're gonna consider Jesus in this text. Peter's not the hero in this text. The disciples are not the hero. Jesus is the hero in this text. And we're gonna consider how great Jesus is in this text because that's the point of this whole thing that Jesus does with his disciples. He wants them to recognize that truly he is the son of God. And so, listen, I wanna encourage you. It's really important I want you to take some notes down. I've got some points uh, just on behalf of Pastor Aaron. I wanted to alliterate these points because I believe that alliteration is anointed by God. And and so we're gonna have some points and, and I want you to write down these points because listen, when you take notes in church, it makes you look holier than your neighbor and that's the point of church. So let's consider Jesus. Number one, let's consider the intention of Jesus. The intention of Jesus. We find it right here in this text. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat in verse 22 and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. I don't have time to break down all these things, but we learned three specific things about the intention of Jesus here in this text. Number one, that he leads. Number two, that he forces. Number three, that he orchestrates. Jesus is 100% in control here. Do you know I have a very simple job description in life? You wanna hear it? Listen to Jesus and do what he says. That's it. Listen, when we are presented this great commission, in the book of Acts, what did Jesus tell the church to do? Yes, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, but he models something in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter one, what does he tell the disciples to do? He tells them to wait, to pray, and then go. Too many times, especially the church, I know in my life, I know I'm confessing something right here, I just go. I see that's a great idea, that's a great opportunity, this is in front of me, and I just go. I wonder what would happen if we'd wait. You see, a lot of times when we just go, we go and we step out to the idea that's before us. And because now we're stepping out according to our plans and there's no power in our plans, now we wait. And we're like, what in the world? I thought this was an awesome opportunity. I thought this was a great opportunity. It's not a God opportunity. And so we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And we're like, why isn't anything working? Why aren't we seeing people saved? Why isn't things happening? And then we get desperate. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us in this room only pray when we're desperate. I wonder what would happen if we waited upon the Lord. We truly sought after the Lord. And then when he spoke to us as our commander in chief, we militantly obeyed the Lord. You see, Jesus is orchestrating this. He's leading his disciples. He makes them go into the boat. He pushes the crowds away. He goes up on the mountaintop. 
he's leading this. And this is not random. Nothing Jesus ever does is random. He is orchestrating something. And sometimes the second point there, he forces. Anybody thankful that Jesus has forced you sometimes? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Forceful rest has been important in my life. Sometimes I've had no choice but to rest. And then he orchestrates. He's forcing things and he's orchestrating and he's orchestrating things because he's about to teach his disciples something so important, which brings us to the second thing, the intercession of Jesus. As he pushes these disciples into the boat and as he goes up upon the mountain after dismissing the crowds in verse 23 and 24, it says that he was by himself praying. There's two things we know about the intercession of Jesus. Number one, we know that he prays. Number two, we know that he knows. My dad had the great privilege of being Dr. Billy Graham's pastor. And he wrote a book with the Billy Graham Association called When God Prays. Isn't it amazing that God prays for us? Do you know that even if you're at a place right now and your back's against the wall, you don't know what to do with something that's going on in your life, can I assure you that God's word says that the Holy Spirit will intercede for you with groans too deep for words? He prays. But secondly, he's up on the mountain and, and what's going on with the disciples? They come upon a storm. Um, there was never one second where Jesus didn't know that there was a storm. I know a lot of us feel like when we're in the storm that Jesus has forgotten about us. He knows. In fact, may I submit this to us today? He's the one who led them into the storm. So he knows this, the intercession of Jesus. Always trust that Jesus is there. And today, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, may I with the power of the Holy Spirit through these words, urge you by God's grace to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For when you are in Christ Jesus, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can trust in Jesus and you can trust the intercession of Jesus, which brings us to the intervention of Jesus. We find the intention, the intercession, but in verse 25 through verse 32, I don't have time to read all this, we find the intervention of Jesus. There's a number of things we find about Jesus here. First, that he arrives. Second, that he reveals. Third, that he answers. Fourth, that he saves. Isn't it amazing that he arrives? But he doesn't arrive right away. He arrives on the fourth watch of the night. You have to go into the book of John to find this. In the book of John, it says that the disciples rode for about three to four miles before Jesus showed up. <laughs> I played basketball like 40 pounds ago. I would have tapped out at mile two, I'm just telling you. Three to four miles, these guys were in the storm rowing. Some of you guys have come into this room today, and this is you. You're here, you're in the middle of the storm. Life is piling up on you, left and right, and you're right here. May I share this with you? Maybe Jesus is leaving you in this place for a while because see, Jesus is not just worried about this moment, he's preparing the disciples for future moments. And in this moment, these disciples are building spiritual muscles that's gonna prepare them for future moments. I played basketball as I shared with you Throughout college, listen, what a great game last night. Throughout college, we were awful. Now, it might have been me as the problem, but we were on terrible teams. I couldn't understand why God would allow me after such a successful high school career to have such a terrible college career, and then it dawned on me. God was preparing me to plant a church. <laughs> he was preparing me for something. And so he arrives, isn't it amazing though that he arrives here in this text and as he arrives, he um, shares who he is. He says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, what, what is significant about this? He reveals who he is before he calms the storm. What does that tell us here in the house? Real peace, guys, is not found in the absence of problems. It's found in the presence of Jesus. 
When my father-in-law died of cancer a few years ago, the most powerful praise that ever came out of my family's lips was actually when my father-in-law died because he loved Jesus and we praised Jesus in the storm. Praising Jesus when it's all good and the storm's calm, that ain't real praise. Real praise comes when all you got is Jesus. And sometimes Jesus will put you in the storm. He'll leave you at this place. So he reveals, and after he reveals, don't you love Peter? Peter steps out. And Peter says, command me and I'll come. He's fully aware he can't do this. And I just love the faith. Some of you guys, take that leap of faith. He steps out on the water and he takes this leap of faith. I don't know what you're gonna do, God. I don't know how this is gonna happen, but I see And you're walking on water and I want to be a part of what you're doing. So Jesus invites him out and and very quickly, as you would too, Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and begins to sink and we find that Jesus immediately reaches out and saves Peter. He brings Peter into the boat, which brings us to the next point here. We find the inspiration of Jesus. It says those in the boat worshiped him saying, Truly, you are the son of God. Which means what? Before this, they weren't convinced. (laughs) Before this, they had doubts. Yes, they had thrown down their nets to follow him, but they were, man, concerned. Man, Jesus, we're walking around as homeless people right now. People hate us. People are doubting us. I don't know what you were doing, that catfish po'boy miracle. Awesome, but how'd that happen? And, and all this walking on water, and now you're going, and they weren't convinced, but in this moment, as Jesus brings them in, and he loves them, he teaches them that he is. He is. I, I preached a series in the city of New Orleans five years ago on the I am statements of Jesus. We called it Big Easy Jesus. Do you know what I'm preaching in Pittsburgh right now? Steel City Jesus. I don't know what we, Louisville slugger Jesus is what we would call it here, I don't know. But, but whatever, whatever we do, what am I doing? I think it's mostly important, I don't know about y'all, I'm kind of tired of hearing everybody's opinion about everything. What does Jesus say about himself? That's what we're gonna build this new church in Pittsburgh upon, the words of Jesus. And in these statements, Jesus declares, I am the bread, I am the light, I am the door, I am the resurrection, I am the way, I am the vine. And so write this down here. Little belief, little trust. Big belief, big trust. The greatest thing Jesus could do for his disciples before they would be sent out, filled by the Holy Spirit to go and make disciples of all nations was to build up a big trust in Jesus. A big trust in Jesus. And once Jesus does this, It brings us to our final point, the invitation of Jesus. You know, sometimes you gotta learn to trust before you live to trust. And the invitation of Jesus is found later on in Matthew chapter 28, you know this scripture. It's called the Great Commission. But I wanna show you something amazing in this text. In Matthew chapter 28, it says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority, He is. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here now is the X factor to the Great Commission. Jesus declares, behold, I am he is, I am, he is with you always to the end of the age. This is the X factor to the Great Commission. I don't know what kind of strategies we're gonna come up with in the church. I don't know what our buildings are gonna look like in the future. I don't know what the landscape's gonna be in our country for Christianity and the freedom for us to proclaim, but I know this. Jesus was, Jesus is, Jesus will be completely victorious. That's what I know. So guys, as I took this leap of faith, 
to the city of Pittsburgh. I had the privilege of preaching on my last Sunday with the church that I had planted. I prayed and asked the Lord for two things. Lord, would you allow me to see this church in the healthiest place it's ever been as I leave, and would you give me the privilege of raising up the next leaders? Do you know the Lord answered that prayer? <laughs> my last Sunday, I got up to preach on gospel multiplication. It was packed. We broke an attendance record that Sunday. It hurt my feelings because it was like they were throwing a party I was leaving. <laughs> and I got up to preach. God poured out. That night I had the privilege of preaching an ordination service of three new pastors who would lead this church, one of whom received a call by God to move to Pittsburgh with me. Once again, packed out, it hurt my feelings. When I finished preaching that service, a big guy, his name's Kirk, six foot seven, 300 plus pounds, comes walking down front. He's walking towards me and when he walks, you pay attention. And Kirk's one of our leaders in our men's ministry in New Orleans and, and Kirk says, Pastor Rob, I came this morning, I was a little upset with you. I don't understand why you gotta leave us and go to Pittsburgh. And I said, well, Kirk, I, I want you to know I've been struggling too, please don't hit me. <laughs> and he goes, but then God began to convict me tonight and I'm, I'm coming down on mission to tell you something. He said, I want you to know, I know you love us and I know that you care for us and I know, I know that you love the city of New Orleans and, and I, I gotta believe you're struggling, but then God began to convict me as I, I came this morning, we start celebrating how God's advancing his kingdom, not just here in New Orleans, but now in the city of Pittsburgh. And then I come tonight and this is this big celebration and it dawned on me, Pastor Rob, if you wouldn't have come to New Orleans 10 plus years ago to plant this church, today I wouldn't know Jesus and I'd be divorced. God's spoke to me so clearly that there's someone in Pittsburgh who used to be like me. And if you're struggling right now, Pastor Rob, I'm just down here to tell you, you ain't got no choice. You're going to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so honestly, I'll just be, yes, God called me, but I might be in Pittsburgh because he threatened my life. I'll just <laughs> keep it real. Regardless, can I just promise you this? What Jesus Christ has done for me, not in an advancement of me or anything of this world, what Jesus Christ has done for me to save me by his grace and what he's done for me in using me despite me in his amazing grace to advance his kingdom to the ends of the earth, Highview Baptist Church, Jesus Christ can do the same for you. For he is. I invite you today to trust in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for my incredible friends here today that as we respond, Lord, that we would trust in Jesus. Lord, I pray for my friend who might be here today who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord. Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you bring conviction upon their life. And Lord, would your kindness lead them to repentance? Lord, may they today deny themselves, take up their cross and follow you. Save sinners today, Lord Jesus. And for those, Lord Jesus, who know you, who, who've journeyed with you a long time, God, I pray that you would build within them a big faith in you. For you are the great I am. And Lord Jesus, we surrender and we say to you, whatever, Lord Jesus, wherever, we will follow you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.